so much for introducing me. Um, I'm Lynn Parsi. I'm co-chairperson for Sydney, Australia. And um, I, I can only say I'm more than blessed to be on this platform, um, sharing my story on Her Story Circle with Gertrude and you amazing, wonderful women. My story, um, uh, I guess it starts off when I would say when I was about nine. Um, when I turned nine, uh, I lost my father. And um, by the time I got to 15, I'd lost my mom, my dad, and all my siblings. So I'm literally the only surviving, surviving member of our family. I lost all my family to HIV. And um, at that time, you know, Zimbabwe was, HIV was such a new thing. It was such a, um, it, was, it was a disease where people, if, if anyone found out that anyone in your family has got HIV, you'd be, you know, an outcast in the family. It, it's, it was like leprosy, you know, when everybody doesn't want to touch you, no, no one wants to be your friend because you can pass it on. Of, of course, because of lack of education. But I guess um, between my age of nine and 15, after we lost my dad, my mother saw it fit to, to, to give us an opportunity to educate us and to, to give us all the love that she could and pass on all the life skills and everything else that she, a mother, you know, a mother could so that she could equip us to, to get out there in the world and be strong, be resilient, be loving and caring and giving and everything else. And to date, I, I, I completely appreciate those lessons that I learned because those lessons I learned, um, I guess, contributed to me meeting Gertrude. And um, I remember the first time I met Gertrude, she said, okay, because I was, you know, being under, under 50, I wasn't part of the women that she was looking for. She said, okay, tell me your story now. <laughs> so I had to quickly share my story with her and I made the criteria, I made the cut. So I guess um, I, I, I'm grateful for that as well, just having those experiences. So um, moving on, the lessons that I learned from my mom, it was all about being your true self always being loving, always being caring, despite anything you go through in life. She was an outcast because she's the mom who's left with all these children and yes, she's sick and the whole community knows about it. So she had to be strong. We had no idea she was going through a lot um, as a woman in the society, I mean, um, living with HIV. So obviously she saw it fit that, let me keep on teaching, teaching my children. So fast forward, um, after my parents were gone, um, my family, my immediate family, obviously extended family, took over uh, looking after me. I remember very well the last day my mom, uh, when my mother died, she sat us down and said to me, uh, now life begins. I know you're not 40. A lot of people always say life begins at 40, but now life begins. Um, she said to me, on my funeral, I don't want you to cry. It's going to be difficult, but I don't want you to cry. I want you to be strong. I want you to take that opportunity to look at people, be silent and be observant because you only get one opportunity at a funeral to really see the true colors of people. The ones who are going to come and laugh, the ones who are genuinely in pain and you get to learn a lot. And she said to me, as an orphan, your funeral can be for the rest of your life. You are always going to cry, but you cry at night. Don't let people always see your weakness because when you're alone, you're more vulnerable. And when you're crying, you're more vulnerable. So always wear that brave face and cry at night. So strangely enough, on uh, the day she died on her funeral, we saw quite a lot. Oh my goodness. I was sitting, remember in Africa when um, 
when uh, a family member dies, uh, your immediate family member dies, be it a parent or a husband or a wife, they get a little mattress, that like a foam little mattress, they put it on the corner so that, you know, everybody knows who you are. You know, you're, this, you're the subject of the entertainment for the day. So everybody needs to know who you are. So we were sitting there with my stepbrother and my stepsister, of which I only now say step because of, um, you know, just for the purposes of telling my story. But to me, they're not my step sister or stepbrother because that was like a, a vulgar word in my family. No one knew that we didn't share parents. We were just bound with love. So we're sitting there just scratching each other saying, look at auntie such and such, look at what she's doing, look at what she's doing. You know, some others throw little tantrums and you're like, oh, wow, <laughs> okay, <laughs> is this how you're going to act? And you see people giggling and laughing away. And, you know, it was such an opportunity for us to learn a lot. So moving on, um, these family members took over and life really began like what mom said. I think I have survived um, you know, it, people always say a cat has nine lives. I don't think a cat has nine lives. I think it's got a thousand, a trillion lives. You die and you wake up and you die and you wake up. And when I say you die, you're not dying physically. Your, your soul dies. You're constantly dying because of the abuse, the torture, the verbal abuse, sexual abuse, emotional abuse. I could write a, di a dictionary, you know, listing all the types of abuse I started facing, you know, from my most immediate family, the same people that my mother thought, you know, these are going to care for you. She never thought that they would be that horrible. She thought that, you know, you might go through a few things here and there, but, you know, sometimes I'll go without food. Uh, several times I attempted to commit suicide because of the pain that I was going through just way too much. You get to in a situation where you're sexually abused and you go to a family member and report it. And, you know, as a young child, I'm 15, you'll be like, oh, it's your, pro it's, it's your fault because you're a prostitute. And these are the people who are supposed to be, you know, uh, you know, put, protecting you. They're your family. But in all those situations, I would always go back to, the, to my mom's lessons and always, you know, hold on to those lessons that don't worry. It's a storm that's happening right now. Tomorrow is a brand new day. It's a brand new leaf. Don't you worry about it. You're a survivor. You'll be fine. Again, fast forward. I just, um, by the time I was 20, 20 years old, my family was starting to ask that, when are you going to get married? When are you going to get married? Because they really wanted me to get out of the family because I guess I was a bit of a burden, I would assume, or I have no idea the reasons why there was so much pressure, of which sometimes it does come in African families. And by the time you get to 18, they feel like you're so grown up, you need to go. So by the time I was 21, I got married. And I felt like I, w I walked from a hellish a hellish situation to hell itself. I literally became the devil's God, I would say. And I walked into, I guess, in a marriage that was, uh, that involved a lot of domestic violence from day one. I thought, you know, okay, now I'm grown up. I've passed this phase that my mom and dad and family are gone. These people have been, you know, they did what they could. I'm not saying that everything that they did was horrible, you know. They did what they could, but of course it was it's such a traumatic experience for me. But you would hope that, you know, once you get married, you're going to have this fairy tale princess life where Prince Charming comes and saves you and everything is wonderful. Married a man who was so intensely abusive. You know, he would wake up and um, say, oh, I dreamt that you were cheating on me and I'll get a beating. Oh, my cousin told me that you dated in high school and I'll get a beating. It could be anything. If I went past seven days without a beating, it would be a miracle. I endured that domestic violence until for nine years of my marriage. 
And in that marriage, I, I had three babies. So I've got two heaven babies. I lost two children because I was forced into aborting these pregnancies because they weren't part of his budget. I wouldn't use contraception, but if I got pregnant, he would literally just say to me, if you know what's best for you, you better abort that child. But because I came from such a, a dysfunctional uh, family, uh, extended family member situation, I did not know where to run to. I mean, if my mom was alive at that point, obviously from day one, I would have run back to mama. But I knew that even if I ran back to that hellish place, it didn't make a difference for me because it was hell everywhere for me. So I endured and I'll dig down in those little lessons, you know, those valuable principles that my mom gave me that grounded me to be who I am today. And I would get, you know, sometimes he, he wouldn't allow me to study. I wasn't allowed friends. He had a list of written rules. And you know, th these things happen. I had a list of written rules. Do not answer the phone when I'm not here. Do not go to the supermarket when I'm not here. Do not let anybody in the house. You know, he wrote all these rules for me when we were dating. And he actually asked me to sign it. And I did. And I thought it was a joke because I was young and naive. So every time he would give me a beating, he would say, are you forgetting the rules that I gave you? And I was in shock that, wow, okay, what did I sign up for? Who do I tell? At that point, being, um, I was in New Zealand now, we, we had migrated to New Zealand. So, so you can imagine my family being, uh, for people who know New Zealand, I was living in a place called Taita with my husband. And my family was living in, no, sorry, I was living in Stocks Valley and my family was just in Taita. That's a walking distance. You literally could walk. Back in Africa, you walk. You don't need to catch the bus, such a distance. So you can imagine I would endure beatings. I would sleep outside. New Zealand is cold. It's freaking cold in the winter. There's one point when I was pregnant. I slept outside at night because I had a beating from my husband because he felt that uh, at that point I changed the TV channel be before he felt it was appropriate for it to be changed. So I slept outside. I had nowhere to go. And I, the saddest thing at that point was that I didn't know what to do. I wasn't a, um, at that time, I wasn't, a, uh, wasn't a permanent resident. I was carrying a child. I wasn't a New Zealand permanent resident. I was still on my visitor's visa, waiting for my workers, um, my work visa to be approved. So I didn't know that I had a right to call the police. I didn't know that I had a right to call women's refugee. I didn't, I, 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 I didn't know I had any rights to call anybody at all, to call for help because I was an immigrant. So I just kept quiet and kept on enduring this. I fell into depression. I was on antidepressants. Um, I would have anxiety attacks. You know, if he would call me and say, come and pick me up at work. If, if I was two minutes late, he would name call me. You're a bitch, you're this, you're that, you're, you know, ungrateful. I went through a lot. I nearly died one day smashing my head on the, floor, on, on the floor. And my little boy was born at that stage. He was only about 12 months. You know, it, it, it was quite a lot. And... Neighbors at one point got to a point where they got sick and tired of the beatings. They called the cops on my behalf. And I was so happy that day. But then when he got to prison, I just started thinking that, okay, if I go to jail, this is like a, <clears throat> you see it on TV in America, you know, where it becomes a little cycle. And I said, I've got a boy child. If he goes to jail, then maybe my son might end up going to jail too. So let me help him get out. I helped him get out. And the first thing he did out of getting out, he came to beat me up. He beat me up, not because I got him, because I'd done anything. He just said, because you're dumb. I said, you're stupid, you're a fool. I confess everything that I do to you, to the police. 
and you thought that you want to be the hero. So you can pay your lawyer's bill, it was about 5,000 at that point, you can pay your lawyer's bill and piss off. But again, I would dig into those principles and, and, and lessons that I was given by my mom that don't worry, it's gonna be fine. The brand new day, what he does or what anyone does to you in life doesn't define who you are. Just be strong, you'll be fine. So I would always think about these lessons and I would keep on pouring love out there and, and just keep on surviving. So we ended up getting a divorce, obviously. I'm here, I'm alive, I'm happy. You know, uh, everything that I learned, I owe it to my mom. She was just an amazing, amazing woman. And like I said, I owe it to her. For me to be here, for me to keep on pushing through in life, to be able to share my story now is because I learned quite a lot. It doesn't mean that you have to be an immigrant to continue suffering. Even if you don't have any support from anywhere, you can reach out to the police. You don't have to be, you know, it, to have a specific residence status in a country to seek help. So I'm making it my mission to speak out because a lot of women out there, they don't talk about these situations because we are worried, we are scared, and we fear that, uh, that you know, the community is going to shun us or, you know, we're going to become an outcast in the society, this and that is going to happen. But at the end of the day, it creates so much trauma for us. It affects our children. So I think it's for... <coughs> Um, can you guys hear me? Hello? Can you guys hear me now? Yes. yes. Oh, perfect. Sorry, my network is really bad. <laughs> uh, I feel like sometimes I live in the, out in the warp, warp but um, it's just technology. So uh, I was just saying, um, I've made it my mission in life to advocate for orphans and say to people, look, you have to remember that these orphans are children. They're children that need love and affection and care. Um, uh, I, I advocate for women who are facing domestic violence who don't know what to do. And I, uh, it's just early days. I'm following through uh, Gertrude's guidance and hopefully uh, out there I might make an, an impact as well. And um, if you hear of any speaking opportunities, people would love to share. I mean, if you'd love for me to share my story as well, please, you're more than welcome to invite me. Uh, I'm more than happy to speak with anyone who is happy to listen and spread the word. If you hear of anybody who's going through this, please speak up. I could have woken up you know, in, in, in hospital. I could have found myself in the morgue and my children would have been suffering now, losing parents through domestic violence. I made it, I survived, but a lot of women out there aren't surviving. So please do what you can, spread the love, spread the support. Thank you so much for listening. Oh, and one thing, I've written a book with Gertrude with the help of the amazing Gertrude Marchi through her publishing company, and my book is called uh, Transmuting Pain to Power. So it's my whole life story. It doesn't start off when I was nine. It literally starts from when I was about two to date. So if you go on her story um, link, you can uh, purchase the book. And yeah, please support me as well. Thank you so much, ladies.